CD. Revelation chapter 1. Um, many of you guys remember Diane. Diane sings here for us, right, on, on Sunday mornings. Diane comes and leads music sometimes. She usually can't be here on Wednesdays because she has to report to her probation officer. <laughs> but, 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 it's, um, but she's usually okay. She can get, well, Sundays they give her the weekends off. So Revelation chapter, chapter 1. For nearly, this is a quote by Merrill Tenney. Some of you might have remember Merrill Tenney, great scholar from a generation, half a generation ago. He wrote this in 1957 in his commentary on the book of Revelation. He says, for, ne for nearly 19 centuries, the book of Revelation has been both an inspiration and a mystery to the Christian church. In hours of darkness, it has given courage to its readers, enabling them to endure persecution and death for the sake of Christ. In periods of ease and prosperity, it has been the battleground of a consistent eschatology, study of the end times. For the seemingly desultory assortment of seals, trumpets, beasts, and bowls, they have sought to derive a systematic pro program of the present or the coming age. All of these interpreters have found some true insights, even though not all of them can be right in every detail. So I, I said that quote because in getting into the Revelation, a lot of us have a, a foregone conclusion or a, a, a bent towards how this is going to, um, what you believe in the book of Revelation, how you take the book of Revelation and things. So I want to let you know, going into this, there's, these are some promises I'll make you. First of all, we're going to study hard. We're going, to, we're going to use multiple resources in every verse and every passage to get it right. We're going to basically do overviews of each chapter, but we may take the liberty to break a chapter down to, into a couple weeks and, su and, and such. We promise not to make, number two, outlandish statements that cannot be substantiated with clear scriptural proof. The little beast where it says Apollyon, Apollyon. I was reading one of my commentaries in preparation for this, and one of the, the commentators said that those were Soviet helicopters shooting nerve gas at people. I said, well, maybe they could be right, I guess. What if John's looking at a helicopter? He might think it's a flying scorpion. But um, would, I, would I be dogmatic about that? No, I wouldn't be dogmatic about that. But this, he was pretty dogmatic about it. We're not going to get dogmatic about things we can't be dogmatic about. We will admit we don't know if we just don't know. It's going to be that simple. I have no problems doing that. <laughs> the four basic approaches in understanding the book of Revelation, I'm going to take what they call the futuristic approach, which is, I would say, the most common approach, at least in my circles that I understand, that people take. Chapter 1 deals with the past. Chapter 2 and 3, which we'll be getting into in the next couple of weeks, deal with the things that were present at the time the book was written. I should stop right there for a little bit. It talks about the seven churches of Asia Minor. And um, we're going to be discussing them next week. And what we'll probably end up doing with Pastor Ryan on that, uh, we'll probably like almost like tag team that. He'll take Thyatira, I'll take Sardis. He'll take, and we'll just go back and forth that we got through all seven churches. Because these, these churches have tremendous significance for the church today. So we want to make sure that we do a thorough job. We may actually add a week to the, the series after that. Uh, into, the, into the overview of the whole program. And then on chapter 4, Pastor Lewis, you're going to be, many years ago, he wrote a book on the pre-tribulational rapture, a little booklet, did a wonderful job on it. And, and Revelation chapter 4 is one of the key passages for the pre-tribulational rapture. So he's going to teach on that. I believe it's November 6th or something like that. That might, could possibly change too. So that's sort of an overview of where we're going, and then we'll be off into some pretty cool stuff. And near the end of the book, we're going to be talking about heaven. Oh, that's my favorite subject in all the Bible, is, is the subject of heaven. And we're going to spend some time talking about heaven. So when you look at the world, getting into the message, um, how do you see the world? Do you see the world microscopically or macroscopically? Microscopically is that which pertains to myself. I view the world through, through my own pain, through my own loss, through my own wants, through my own desires. Or that's how I see the world. Or I view the world macroscopically, which is I see the world through CNN <laughs> and Fox News. And, and both can be a little daunting, can't they? Who, who feels blessed after they watch an hour or two of news? 
Yeah, if you, it doesn't build you up. You just feel like, wow, I feel so good about my future here. I know the people in Washington are doing such a good job. They have my best interests at heart, and everything's so good. And, um, and no, we, not, I, watch, I used to watch a lot of news. Now I barely, I watch a little, probably under 10 minutes a day. I read the headlines in the morning. I see what happened during, before I go to bed, and that's about it. Because it's just, I find that it does nothing for me. It does not build me up or build my soul up. In fact, I look, at, I look at the news and I look at my little girl, Sadie, and I say, oh my man, if it's this bad now, what's going to be like her when, when she gets older? And I tremble even thinking about it. Or I look at the world microscopically. This is what, how it pertains to me. Where do I fit in this whole thing? Where is my place on this great, great, late, great late planet Earth? As his body of death continues to have more signs of getting older and disease, and I say goodbye to friend after friend after friend and loved ones, where's my place? Well, I think however you look at the book of Revelation, whether or your life, I should say, if you see your life primarily macroscopically, or you see your life primarily microscopically, and I think um, we probably do both. I know I probably use it both ways. I think you'll find as we go through this book, and especially at the end of this book, that it's going to do the same, give you the same effect. It's going to give you hope. This book is going to leave you with hope. This book was written from Jesus Christ to you and I as children. And he, he didn't give us this book to scare, scare us. He didn't give us this book to give us nightmares. He gave us this book to reveal what was coming and to leave us with hope. And you can follow the track throughout the book as we go chapter to chapter. You'll find that, that there is, yeah, some pretty, some pretty scary things when you start looking at the tribulation period and the, and the great battle of Armageddon and the incredible pressure that will be on the planet Earth. And that's how come you're going to be very happy you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture when you get to those chapters. And, um, and then, but then it deposits us right before the throne of God. When, when it's all finally over, through his return to earth or our death, whichever comes first. Let me read the verses for tonight. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants the things which must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. You pick out these little gems in this passage here. We'll be bringing them out in a little bit. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace. From him who is, and who was, and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. And made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every one and every eye will see him, even those that pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I heard a missionary relaying, a, a, he's on a man on a mission trip relaying a story back probably 15, 20 years ago. How many of you remember the dream team, the first dream team? Remember it started in the early 90s, the great, the best U.S. basketball players got together for the first time in the Olympics and Larry Bird and Michael Jordan and, and, and Julius, not Julius Irving, who's the guy from L.A., Magic Johnson and stuff. And all those guys get together on one team they call the dream, dream team. Well, this missionary's son was left behind on the missionary trip, true story, and he is, his dad calls him from the mission field halfway across the world, and his dad calls him, and, he, and his son gets on the phone, hi, dad, how are you? Dad, I'm, I'm really nervous right now. The dream team is at halftime, and the dream team is losing by 25 points. He was freaked out. His dad tells the story. 
Son, it's, it's going to be okay. Don't, no, Dad, you don't understand. This is a dream team. They're losing to like Puerto Rico or something like that. That doesn't, that's not supposed to happen. This is a dream team. This is all his heroes in the NBA was on this team. And all of a sudden he saw all of his heroes being beat by a third world country. And he couldn't cope with the thought of his team not winning. So his dad says, look at son, let me, let me explain to you. Son, I'm going to make you a promise. The dream team will come back. The dream team is going to come back, and the dream team is going to win this game. Dad, how do you, how do you know that, Dad? How do you know that? He goes, son, you've got you to trust me on this. Your dad just knows these things. I know they're going to come back and win this game. So the son, they talked the, ne the next day or whatever. The dream team came back and won that basketball game. And he goes, Dad, how do you know? Well, son, it's simple. We're 12 hours ahead of you here. <laughs> and, and, and that game was that game was over a long time ago. I already saw the ending, so I know how I know how it turned out. <laughs> That's the sort of revelation is. Revelation gives us a view at the end. It lets us know who wins. It lets us know how the game is played out. It lets us know how it all ends. So we know at the very end, no matter what's happening here on planet Earth or what's happening macroscopically or microscopically, whatever's happening in our life or around our life or in our country, we know how it ends. Ultimately, the book of Revelation will show us in the final victory that we will be standing with the Lamb of God, and we don't have to really worry for, the, for, the, for what really matters. We really don't have to worry. So here we go. Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things which must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. So the revelation was given from the Father to the Son to all the adopted children, you and I, us, to show us, and I thought this was interesting, what soon must take place. I, I hear that. God, I know what soon means in my mind, but I, God, do you know what soon means? Because <laughs> it seems to me your soon God and my soon are two different soons. Because my soon means this is really going to happen, like soon. God soon is like, yeah, it's going to happen soon. Two, three thousand years. <laughs> His soon and my soon are two very different soons, which is important because sometimes, my friends, we will put a lot of personal stake and personal emotion into soon. When we question the timing of God, I can't even begin to remember the times when I thought God was late. God, this all has to happen by this date, by this time, or it's going to be too late. And every time I've given God that deadline, God missed it. <laughs> I will at the time God missed it. <laughs> and, and, but, in the, in, and, but that's because I had a different soon than God. So it's, it's important not to wrap too much around the word soon here, because we like to do that. The prophecy preachers love to do that. It's going to happen soon. And Israel became a nation in 1948. And the fig tree bloomed. And another generation, all these things are going to pass. And, and we all, we love to wrap a lot of stuff around this soon. But we really don't know soon. Only God knows soon. So this is God's soon. What soon should do for us, or I may want to interpret the word soon as at any moment, what soon can do for me, it can put an urgency in my life. It can reprioritize my values. It can make me more focused on what's really important and about the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of me. See, soon has a purpose to it. So we live as though soon could happen in any moment. If we knew that Jesus was coming soon, if we knew he was coming at 8 p.m. tonight, our lives would change, wouldn't they? How our relationships with loved ones would change. Our relationship with our finances would change. Our relationships with, with um, ourselves would change. Our relationship with God would change. It would all, our relationship with time would change. It would all change if we knew exactly when soon was. We would adjust whatever it meant if we knew exactly when he was coming back. Most of God's children, unfortunately, live as though soon as never. But in the moment, soon can be now. 
in a moment. Verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. We're being blessed right now by reading this. And blessed are those who hear. You're being blessed by hearing. And watch this. And blessed are those who keep what is written in it. So if blessed are those who read it, that would be me. Woohoo! Blessed are those who hear it. That'd be you and me because I'm listening too. So I get double blessing. <laughs> That's why I got ordained. And, um, and, then, and, then, and then, and who keep what is written in it. Then we obey it, whatever it is. For the time, here he says it again, the time is near. So we're promised to be blessed. And keep means to plan to put what we are instructed in this book into practice. Time is a word. There's two different words for time in the Greek New Testament, two primary words. This is the most general word, chronos, and it means, in a sense, at any time. It's the whole expanse of time. It's, it's the other word they use is, is a time, a karyos. It's a word, a real specific pointed time. But God didn't use that word. He used chronos here, which is a, an expanse of time. So God knows what that time is. We really don't know what time that time is. We just know, according to God, that it's soon. <laughs> we know it's soon. So the apostle is saying the time could be any time. The time where I meet Jesus face to face. Now this is talking about his return, my friends, but we know that this, as we've gone through life that this means death too. That time can be any time. There is no guarantee of longevity I've done memorial services for newborns and for one-year-olds and two-year-olds and three-year-olds and four-year-olds and five-year-olds and six-year-olds and 102-year-olds. Many, many, many of them. So there are no promises. The only promise is that soon will come. That's the promise. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings on earth. This is so full of wonderful theology here, but we can't even really get into it all. To him that loves us, he has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us a kingdom, priest to his God and father to him be glory for dominion forever and ever. Amen. So what you find in these verses, you find the Trinity and the preexistent Lord. I won't get into a lot of those things. They're all in view here. You see, Jesus Christ is the only one to resurrect from the dead. You see Jesus as the king of all kings who rule the earth. He is, he was, and always will be. That's who he is. Now, taking that into, into um, view, the, the triune God, the king of kings, who always was, who is, and always will be, and then the apostle writes, to him. Yeah, that one, the one we just described, to him who loves us. That's pretty cool. To him that agapes us that loves us beyond our weakness, that loves us beyond our faults, that loves us beyond our indecisions, our unclear motives, our self-deceptions, the same one who freed us from our sins by his blood. That's the God that loves us. And he made us a kingdom. That's singular. That's important because if you have a King James Bible, it probably says he made us kings and priests, and, and that's probably not accurate. That isn't accurate. It's, a, it's singular. It should be he made us a kingdom and priest. And that's significantly different, even though he's given us royalty, and he's given us dignity, and he's placed us inside of his family. So even on saying we're part of a king, that's true. I mean, you could, we could argue that in scripture, but that's not what this passage is teaching. He says he's given us a kingdom. He's made us a kingdom. He made us a kingdom. I'm going to call this, and this will be sort of debatable in some theological circles, but most would agree that this kingdom is you. You're the church. 
his family, his family alive on earth. He's given us a kingdom, his pilgrims, his aliens, those who, are named, who name his name, those who are marked by the family of God that walk on the planet earth. I think one of the most important doctrines in our day, 2013, is understanding what it means to be part of the kingdom of God. If we really embrace what it means to be part of the kingdom of God, we take, we take everything seriously. We take our testimony, how we, how we work in the workplace, because I'm part of the kingdom of God. I'm not of, of this world. I represent a kingdom. I'm an ambassador, 2 Corinthians 5.20, of, of the kingdom of God. So how I work, how I manage my private life, how I treat my family, how I treat others, how I deal with things in a public forum, I'm all part of the kingdom. I'm, I'm a kingdom Christian. I understand that when I give of my financial resources, it's for a kingdom. When I lay down my life and I work with kids in a water or Sunday school, it's, it's because I'm part of a kingdom. When I make time and I carve my time out to come on a Wednesday night and, and hear the word of God, it's because you understand you're part of a kingdom. You're, you're part of something bigger than just time and space, part of something bigger than just what's going on on planet Earth. You're part of God's family, God's anointed ones that he placed here on this planet for a time such as this. I think we would all agree we're living in a difficult time. I think most of us will think that these likely are the end times. I don't know how much worse it can get. I don't see anything in the scriptures that stick out to me that says it couldn't, the return of Christ couldn't happen tomorrow. I don't see any last domino that needs to fall before Jesus Christ has come up hither. <laughs> I don't see any of that. So understanding that God has given you and God has given me this mandate to represent him in this time, this time such as this, that you, my friends, could be the generation of the return of Christ or the generation just before the return of Christ. That's an amazing responsibility and an amazing mandate that God has given us. To represent him in a world that's going to be groaning where people are looking for hope, as we said earlier. When you, go to the, when you go to your workplace, do you sense there's a lot of hope? It's just the opposite, isn't it? There's a despondency. Our economic futures are in, are in question. Our national sovereignty seems to be eroding away. And just when I get ahead financially, something comes up and takes me off at the knees. And, and finally I achieve this and I achieve this and I achieve this and then, then the doctors say, you know, you better come in and talk to me. There are no guarantees. But when I understand that I'm a kingdom, it says, okay, this isn't my world. I'm part of a kingdom on, not of planet Earth, but being lived out on planet Earth. And understanding my role in God's kingdom is essential if the, for the church to really march through history. And you notice it's God's kingdom and it's not our kingdom. It means we function as a gathering of God's people for the advancement of this kingdom. That's why we're here. We're here to bring this kingdom forth, whether I'm, I'm working with youth or whether I'm just supporting through my financial resources, whether I'm on my knees and praying for the lost, however that is, I, my life is much bigger than you define yourself. You may define yourself this way. You may see your life as being small, but there is no small Christian life. There isn't any. When the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords calls you by name, there's nothing small about that. And the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords knows when you're in a nursing home and knows when you're in a hospital and knows when you seem like your life has become insignificant. He's aware of that. There is no insignificant human life in the kingdom of God. Then he calls us priest points to our ability to gain access to the Father without rule or ritual. Something that many call, and we've called through the years, a believer priesthood. Wonderful doctrine. It means when I stand before God, I give an account of my own life. This is huge. 
To believe a priesthood means that I have access, Hebrews 4.16, I can come boldly before this throne of grace to what? Obtain mercy in a time of need. I can come boldly. I don't need permission. I don't need a permission slip. I don't have to do anything. I come boldly before the throne of grace. If I'm filthy, I come boldly before the throne of grace. If I'm clean, I come boldly before the throne of grace. How do you say that? It's because that cross took my sins. That cross took my sins and made me pure and made me holy and made me righteous and made me perfect. Even though I might not be experientially, I am positionally. And because I am, that's how God sees me, endowed and clothed with his righteousness, not my righteousness, I can come boldly before the throne of grace as a priest. But you know what else believer priesthood does? It cuts our noses off. Let's close. <laughs> Just kidding. What do I mean when it cuts us our nose? It's simply this. I can't get my nose in your business. I'm not here to run your Christian life. Because when I stand before God, I'm going to stand before him alone. Right? So I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here to love you. And I hope that's why you're here, to, to just love us and not point the finger. Because this is what believer priesthood does. Believer priesthood says, I'm just going to love you just the way you are because that's what God wants me to do. And if there's something amiss in your life, then I'll speak the truth in love. And I'll do it in a way I'm speaking the truth in love, though. I'm not speaking the truth in judgment. I'm speaking the truth in love because I love you. I'm, I love you enough to speak the truth to you. That's believer priesthood. We're a priest. This was one of the most liberating doctrines for me. Back in 1994, I was a young pastor, and I, and I was, um, loved my pastor at the time, and I found myself very disillusioned with the, the, with the church that I was affiliated with, that I was part of. I found out that some of the people that I trusted at that point weren't trustworthy. And some of the people that I defended actually was, was slandering my family behind my back. It devastated me. Because, like anyone else, I love people's approval. I love to be patted on the back. I love to be loved. Anyone not love to be loved? I love to be loved. So, fire it at me. But, but um, and so, so I, after eight or nine months of struggling with this and being very disillusioned and actually thinking about quitting the ministry and just going back into the, the business world and uh, finding another career, God grabbed me one morning in prayer. You know, it's funny, because God never told me I was right and they were wrong. All God said, he grabbed me one morning with the prayer and my Bible open. He says, Tim, you know what the problem is here? You know why you're so devastated? You know why you're so hurt? It's because you've looked for man's approval more than you have mine. I said, can they be wrong a little bit? <laughs> and he said, no, this is on you. So I repented. And I, and I made that decision at that point is August 1994. I remember the moment very, very well. It was, I made a decision, okay, from this point forward, God, I'm going to live my life before you and to stand before you. And period. So I'm going to run, I'm going to, when it comes to this, I'm going to do my very best to just, this is a wallet if you can't see it, and I'm going to, and it's not very fat, <laughs> and it's, um, I'm going to do this, I'm going to operate this to stand before you. I'm going to be a husband and a dad to stand before you. I'm going to pastor and preach to stand before you. I'm going to be a friend to stand before you. When I'm quiet and no one's around me and I could get away with something, I'm going to live to stand before you because I understand this, that nothing escapes your vision and your insight. And my friends, that was a changing moment for me, and it's all wrapped into this doctrine of believer priesthood. I understood that I have access to Christ, and when I die, I will stand before him alone. Last two verses quickly, and we'll close. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those that pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, to be, says the Lord God, who is who was and who is yet to come, who is to come, the Almighty. So we started with hope in verse 1, and we end with hope in verse 8. He says, I'm coming back soon. All the persecution will stop. 
Disease will disappear. Cancer will no longer exist. Death's sting will cease to be real. Pressure, stress, family problems, all in a moment, they're finished. The groanings of the world's governments all become non-relevant in, in a twinkling of an eye. And all the world's religions are settled once and for all. The moment he comes in the clouds. I don't know when that day is. It's, it's soon, though. We know that it's soon. I don't know what soon means, but I know it's soon because it just told me that it's soon. It's come, but for now, what I want to take from this, I want to live as though it's today. When I'm home with my family tonight, I want to live as though it's today. When I'm alone in the morning, I want to live as though it's today. When I look at those taxes that I'm supposed to pay, I want to live as though it's today.